So hey, turn to Daniel chapter 7. You guys ready? Are you glad to be in church? Yeah. I'm glad to be here as well. It, um, I have my buddy here, Mark Valadez, who uh, was at church first service, and uh, he's just starting his two-month break, and uh, talked to another guy a couple weeks ago, and he's about ready to start his two-month break, so it's contagious. Whatever, whatever's going on among pastors, it's contagious, so... Anyway, Mark was here, and um, Mark and I have been friends going back like, I don't know, 25, 30 years. A lot of you have known him as long or longer, pastor of New Beginnings Nazarene Church in Napomo. We play golf on Mondays. Sometimes he always beats me, um, <laughs> unless, he's feeling, uh, unless he's feeling kind, which doesn't happen very often. He's a Nazarene after all, so... I hear, when you're a pastor and you're hanging out with guys from denominations, you must harass them because they harass me. Oh, you're, you're one of those non-denom guys, right? <laughs> where do you belong? I don't know. I don't know where we belong. But uh, anyway, title of today's message as we get into Daniel chapter 7, are you on the right team? Yeah. Are you on the right team? I asked somebody that a minute ago and they said, I don't think I'm on a team. I'm like, yes, you are. You're on a team either by default or on purpose. You are on a team. Have you ever been on a team? Yeah, yeah. Growing up, you're on a team, but sports or academics or whatever it is, you're on some kind of a team. Um, and listen, if you're not giving it your all on your team, you're giving the other team a, an advantage. And so I encourage you, Give it your all in Jesus' name. Do what God has called you to do. From the beginning of time, God has been letting all creation know that there are two teams in the earth. Two teams. Team Jesus and Team Satan. 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 Two teams. Which team are you on? With that question, let's pray. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for Team Jesus. Thank you that we win. Uh, we know who wins, we do, and we get the victory. We got the victory in Jesus' name. So, Lord, help us to stand firm as followers of our team leader, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we open up Daniel and uh, study Daniel chapter 7, I pray that you would teach us today. Uh, there's no way we're going to get through all of Daniel chapter 7 today, but thank you, Lord, that we've got next week, <laughs> unless you come back, which is totally good, good with me, but we've got next week to study as well, so help us as we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you're not on Team Jesus, then by default, you are on Team Satan. Is that a fair statement? If you're not on Team Jesus, then by default, you're on Team Satan. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 30, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So I was kind of doing some research on the other team, Sometimes you got to research the other team. So I went on churchofsatan.com. <laughs> Pretty interesting site. I'll read you a little bit. It's not scary. No, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, right? Remember, we win. We won the victory on the cross. We're going to be taking communion here pretty soon. Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected, right? So our team wins. Our team wins. Churchofsatan.com, under their fundamental belief section, frequently asked question. A question was asked, why do Satanists worship the devil? Good question, fair question. Why do Satanists worship the devil? Their answer, their answer on the website, we don't. Satanists are atheists, they said. They declared this on their website. Satanists are atheists. We see the universe as being indifferent to us. And so all morals and values are subjective human constructions. Our position is to be self-centered with ourselves. <laughs> Surprise, right? With ourselves being the most important person, the God of our subjective universe. So we are sometimes said to worship ourselves. Anybody like that that you know? <laughs> Never mind, sorry. Our current high priest, Gilmore, they said, Gilmore from the Gilmore Girls, said, calls this step, is anybody know who the Gilmore Girls are? No. All right, don't look it up, don't worry about it. It's just a, my attempt at trying to be culturally relevant. 
Our current high priest, Gilmore, calls this step moving forward from being an atheist to being an atheist. <laughs> Satan to us, they said, is a symbol of pride, liberty, and individualism, and it serves as an external metaphorical projection of our highest personal potential. We do not believe, sat we do not believe in Satan as a being or person. Interesting, right? So Satan has even the Satanists convinced that he doesn't exist. This is like his greatest goal. Hey, don't worry about me. Just worry about yourself. Satan has the Satanists convinced that he doesn't actually exist. Satan doesn't actually need your adoration in the form of worship, like we worship on Sunday morning and throughout the course of our lives. He is content as long as you don't worship the living God. By not truly worshiping Jesus, you are giving Satan's team the advantage. So we have two options. Number one, we worship the one true living God, Jesus the Lord, or we don't. Option two isn't worship Satan. <laughs> Apparently, they don't even worship Satan. They just worship themselves. They make their priorities, their goals, their agendas the most important thing in their lives. That's what it means to be a Satanist, apparently. And so we have two options as human beings in the earth. We worship the one true living God, Jesus the Lord, or we don't. If we refuse to worship Jesus, we are essentially worshiping and exalting Satan. If we don't exalt Jesus and his ways and worldview, then we are by default, exalting Satan's, going along with Satan's ways and world view. So which team are you on? It's important that you decide, I am on Team Jesus, because if you don't decide, I am on Team Jesus, then by default, you are on Team Satan. Is that frustrating? No, it's just the reality, right? It's just the reality of our human condition. No matter where we study in the Bible, we see this reality, Old and New Testament. There are two kingdoms of the world. There is the kingdom, capital K, kingdom of capital L, light. There's the kingdom of light, and then there is the kingdom of darkness. We'll be studying in Daniel chapter 7 today, and as we understand this prophetic book, we see that throughout it, there is a spiritual battle. Then... And now, <laughs> there's a spiritual battle. I haven't been sick for two months, but as soon as I get ready to step into the pulpit for the first time in two months, what happens? I get a dang head gold. There's a spiritual battle. The enemy's trying to throw stuff at us to discourage us and to hinder us. And so we have to, by faith and in God's grace and strength, we gotta move forward doing what God has called us to do in spite of the opposition. There's always going to be opposition. Always going to be opposition. Then and now there is a spiritual battle. Will we, in light of what we're studying in Daniel here, will we worship idols or will we worship the one true God? Now idols in Daniel's day was a 90 foot gold statue, right? That's not the idols that we contend with in the earth today, our idols, the idols that we contend with are anything that we elevate above God's will or plan for our life, whether it's our agenda or anything that we do with our time, talent, or treasure that doesn't honor the Lord. And so we all deal with the same challenges that have been dealt with throughout history. Will we serve our idols or will we serve the living God? In Daniel chapter one, will the Hebrew children eat foods offered to idols, or will they honor the Lord with their decision not to? We're all gonna be faced with the same question. Will we honor the Lord with my actions, with our actions, or, or not? They honored God, and God came through, and that's gonna be the theme, really, as you read the scripture. Whenever you choose to honor God, God will come through. He will take care of you. He will bless you. He will strengthen you. He will help you in your desire to honor him. And as you honor him, God will always come through. In Daniel chapter two, will the Hebrew children trust God 
in the face of an impossible situation. What was the impossible situation? Telling the king his dream and interpreting the dream. Well, the Hebrew children trust God and hear from God and do what God has called them to do. Absolutely. Will they stand firm or will their faith wilt in the heat of constant pressure on them in their godless culture? You will have constant heat on you in this godless culture. Will your faith wilt or will you stand firm? The Hebrew children stood firm. They trusted God and God came through because God always, does he not always come through? <laughs> you know, in my experience, it may not be in my timing or what I expect, but God always, always comes through. That is his character and his nature, it is who he is. In Daniel chapter three, will the Hebrew children bow before the king's 90 foot gold statue to avoid the fiery furnace or will they trust God to deliver them? Will they be willing to die for what they believe? And that was the question. You will die if you do not bow before my statue. Are you willing to not bow and die? Now the Hebrew children believed that God would protect them, but if he didn't, they were willing to go to the furnace, and they did. They got put into the furnace. Three went in. How many were dancing around inside? How many were inside? Four, why? Because the Lord, Jesus, always comes through, and he was in the fiery furnace with them. In fact, when they got ushered out of the fiery furnace, they didn't even smell of smoke. Now listen, if I build a, a bonfire in my back lot, I always smell like smoke. In fact, I have to decide, do I want to build a fire? Because then if I do, I have to change my clothes, I have to take a shower before going to bed. I always have to count the cost, right? These guys didn't even smell like smoke. And they were inside the fiery furnace. They did not bow and God delivered them. Why? Because God always comes through. But they were willing and they got thrown in. And whether God delivered them in this life or the next, God would be faithful. And on and on and on. The choice is simple. Will I exalt and worship the Lord with my decisions? Or will I do what, will I do what humanly speaking is going to save my skin? We'll be faced with those questions all the days of our lives, especially as the time wears on. Daniel continues to do the right thing through the course of his life. Let's look at the vision. Let's look at the Daniel chapter seven, Daniel's vision of the four beasts. Now, first service, the message, the time went so fast <laughs> as it always does. We're gonna get through the description. We'll talk about the description of the four beasts. I'll explain what the four beasts are, what we believe the four beasts are, but then we'll wrap it up uh, the rest of it next week, uh, Lord willing, and... We will take communion uh, at the end of the service today. So I appreciate so much that Pastor Curtis would read through the, the entire text before teaching it. It was really just been really helpful as I've listened to him do that. Um, and it's especially helpful given the nature of the text. So I will do the same. So Pastor and Jeremy and uh, Pastor Curtis have just done an amazing job. I just want to say thank you guys for what you've done. So as we read Daniel chapter 7, go ahead and open up your Bible, or you can do what I'm going to do, because the font in my Bible is about a 10. The font in my iPad's about an 18. So I was practicing reading through in my Bible, and I decided that an 18 font is so much better than a 10 font. And uh, so I'm going to read from my iPad, Daniel Chapter 7, about Daniel's vision of the four beasts. Lord, bless us as we read your word. Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great seas, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then, as I looked, its wings were 
plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to him. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, arise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had 10 horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Verse nine. As I looked, thrones were placed and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. I looked. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the most high shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the 10 horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things and that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, thus he said, as as for the fourth beast, there shall be a, fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms. And it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the 10 horns, verse 24 says, as for the 10 horns out of this kingdom, 10 kings shall arise and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three kings. 
He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law and they shall be given into his hand for a time, time, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominion will serve. All dominions will serve and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Daniel chapter seven. <laughs> so what does all this mean? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Just kidding. I got, a, I got a little bit of idea, so I'll share what my thoughts are. God gave Daniel a prophetic dream concerning the future of things that would happen in the earth all the way up until the second coming of Christ. From then until the second coming of Christ. This is the first time in the book of Daniel that a dream had been given directly to Daniel. And in verse 2, he is quoted in the first person for the first time. So Daniel is given a dream of four beasts. And the text gives us a clue, the interpretation of the dream. Daniel 7, 17 says this, these four great beasts are four kings who shall rise out of the earth. So the four kings representing four earthly kingdoms in this chapter are the same spoken of in Daniel chapter two. So we see the same kings in Daniel chapter two and kingdoms as we see in Daniel chapter seven. Remember the statue that was used to illustrate the four kingdoms? Well, here's a graphic that compares the images in the vision from Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. As we read in Daniel 2, 32 through 33, we get a little more information. Daniel 2, 32 through 33, the head of this image was fine gold, just like we see in the statue. Let's go ahead and keep that up there. Right there, there we go. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So the four kings of the four kingdoms will be Babylon, the kingdom that Daniel is in, being exiled to Babylon. That is the first represented uh, by the gold head. We've got Babylon, you got Medo Persia. So this is prophetic. This is what would come after Daniel's dreams. He would see the kingdom of Babylon and then Medo Persia and then Greece would arise to power and then ultimately Rome would arise to power. So prophetically, God is sharing with Daniel and with us what would come. And so he did that in Daniel chapter 2 and in Daniel chapter 7. Before Christ returns, there will be a revived Roman Empire of sorts. We call it a revived Roman Empire because the elements of iron are intermingled with clay. With the element of iron represented who? Represented Rome. And so we see those elements, the clay and the iron intermingled. The iron legs in Nebuchadnezzar's dream represent Rome. Describing the image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel 2.33, it's legs of iron, it's feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So the revived Roman Empire is commonly associated with the fourth beast of Daniel 7. This beast is described as terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. And if you understood the Roman Empire, you know that that's true. Daniel 7.7 7 says this, after this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. 
It was different from all the other beasts that was before it, and it had 10 horns. So the 10 horns is a, uh, the 10 horns on the beast is a prophetic picture of the revived Roman Empire. The revived Roman Empire is the final world, the final, final secular government before Christ returns to set up his everlasting empire, his everlasting kingdom that will see no end. But as Daniel watches in his dream, a little horn rises from the beast with eyes, like eyes of a human of a human being in a mouth that spoke boastfully. So this horn, this person, boasted, speaking of great things. And who is this horn? This final horn is the Antichrist. The Antichrist will be connected to the revised Roman Empire. So God's giving us a clue about how things will unfold in the end times. The Antichrist is the leader who establishes a seven-year covenant with Israel and then breaks it in Daniel chapter 9 during the tribulation period. So again, this is all future happening during the tribulation period. The Antichrist is the leader who sets up the abomination of desolation that we read about in Mark chapter 13, 14 and Daniel 9, 27. He is the man of lawlessness that we read about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Antichrist simply means against Christ. And so down throughout history, there have always been leaders, people who have been opposed to Christ, against Christ. The Antichrist is opposed to anything honoring Christ down throughout history in the Antichrist, and then the Antichrist that will be revealed when the time is right. This Antichrist is opposed to anything honoring the Christ. He denies the Father and the Son. He, his work is diametrically opposed to God's work. The Antichrist is the antithesis of Christ. The Antichrist will be the leader of the revived Roman Empire, and since the Roman Empire was defunct in the fifth century, we're going to see a, a revived Roman Empire to fulfill scripture, to fulfill prophecy. So we're going to have to kind of wait and see how that unfolds. Um, I don't think we're going to be here, but we'll, we'll be watching it from afar. Again, the revived Roman Empire is linked to the fifth and final kingdom mentioned in Daniel chapter two, where it says this, and as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness, some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. So we're kind of getting a picture of what that final kingdom will look like. It will be partly strong partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with the soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. So in Nebuchadnezzar's dream of an image made of various metals, the iron legs again represent the Roman empire and the feet made partly of iron and partly of baked clay represent the final world empire. The fact that it shares the elements of iron with the fourth kingdom suggests a connection to Rome. So again, we'll see how that kind of unfolds. The 10 toes imply a 10 nation confederacy matching the 10 horns led collectively by a single powerful ruler who is the Antichrist. So the 10 toes and the 10 horns, all of this are yet to unfold, unfold in human history. Other commentators point to Revelation chapter 13. We're eventually going to teach through Revelation. Do you believe that we're actually going to get there? Do you believe that we're going to get there like before Jesus comes back? I'm going to do my best. But if Jesus wants to come back and interrupt my plans, I'm good with that. Revelation chapter 13 describes a beast coming from the sea having 10 horns and seven heads. Revelation 13, 1. This depiction connects it to the fourth beast of Daniel 7, which also has 10 horns. Revelation 13 describes this government as blasphemous. 
and tyrannical and requiring absolute submission in financial, spiritual, and political matters. So this final kingdom that rules over the earth is going to be dark and desperate. More information regarding the four beasts. Daniel 7, 4 speaks of the first beast who was given the mind of a man, probably referring to the conversion, if you call it that, of Nebuchadnezzar. If we read Daniel 3 and 4, we see somewhat of a conversion of Daniel. His heart softens before the Lord, but then later in chapter 4, he's judged by God. Remember, he's on all fours, grazing with dew on his back, and his hair is growing out long as feathers, and his claws are like bird's claws. So, and then uh, he's the Lord, he, he's, the Lord judged him and humiliated him because he was boasting like the Antichrist will boast. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. But we'll, we see that, that that first beast was able to stand up and given the mind of a man. And so we think possibly that the first beast was um, from Babylon was Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and speaking of his conversion there, we'll see. Daniel 7, 5 speaks of the second beast like a bear with three ribs in his mouth. The three ribs probably refer to three kingdoms that comprised the Medo-Persian Empire when it assimilated Babylon. So we see some pretty easy connections there. Daniel 7, 6, the third beast with four heads. The Grecian Empire built by Alexander the Great was divided up into four sections. And so the beast with four heads would represent potentially those four sections, those four parts of the kingdom there in Greece. Daniel 7.7, 7, the fourth beast representing the Roman Empire was terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong with great iron teeth. So the ten horns on this beast and the counterparts of the ten toes of the feet of iron and clay in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, they all work together. And we see in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, we see it. And then Revelation chapter 13, we see it's all working together to give us a snapshot, a picture of what will unfold. Again, this part of the dream and vision represent the last world kingdom in the earth. Remember the last part of Daniel 7, 7 and verse 8, speaking of the fourth beast, it says this. It was different. The fourth beast was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had 10 horns. I considered the horns, he said, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So three of the 10 European nations will give their power to the Antichrist. So those horns were yanked up by the roots and then this other horn rises up. So three of those 10 nations will actually give their power to the Antichrist and who, he will be able to sway men with his corrupt speech, much like his father, the devil, has been doing for generations. So the global power this nation will wield is given to them by Satan. So let's understand something about our adversary, the devil. Satan has power, and it's not to be underestimated. He is very powerful, but greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Our king wins, our God reigns, he will destroy the enemy. Now, the enemy, Satan, is always trying to mimic what God does, and so he's got his unholy trinity. We've got the holy trinity, which is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, Satan has his unholy trinity. He's got, he's got Satan, got the Antichrist, and he's got the false prophet. The Antichrist will speak on behalf of a Satan, just like Jesus speaks on behalf of the Father in heaven. So while the Holy Trinity is characterized by infinite truth, love, and goodness, the unholy Trinity portrays the diametrically opposed traits of deception, hatred, and unadulterated evil. It's good to know our enemy. It's good to know that he's always messing with us. <laughs> Have you noticed that? That he's like always messing with us? When I was a little kid and I was in daycare, um, I'm not sure my mom knows this story because it 
She's not going to like it. But they <laughs> placed my brother and I on this blanket in the corner of the room. And the other kids in the daycare would shoot rubber bands at us. <laughs> they would just torment us with rubber bands. And we were too young to probably say anything or understand what was going on. But I remember to this day that I was tormented by those other kids as they shot rubber bands at me. And I feel like the enemy's the same way. It's like he's just constantly tormenting, shooting rubber bands at me. Would you just go pick on somebody else, right? <laughs> like, but he is. He's picking on everybody. That is what he does. Satan is a counterfeit and can only counterfeit the power of God. He cannot create. He can only pervert. He cannot give. Listen, he cannot give. No matter what the temptation looks like, he cannot give. He can only take. He's got nothing to give but destruction. He's got nothing to give. He can only take your peace, your joy, your victory. He can only take. He's got nothing to give. He is a liar and the father of lies. And so he, when he is promising, whispering something, it is a lie. His natural language is that he is a liar. He is a cheap knockoff and a fraud. Satan is a really poor imitation of our mighty God. And that is why God, this is what God said of him in Isaiah chapter 14, and we'll kind of wrap up with this section here. This is what God said of Lucifer in Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, 12 through 17 says this, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. There's just this constant boasting. I will make myself like the most high. But, verse 15, you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. Is this the man? Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the worlds like a desert and overthrew its cities, who did not, who did not let his prisoners go home? Is this the man who tormented me and came after me constantly all the days of my life? Revelation 20 makes it clear what will become of Satan and his minions. Revelation 20, 10, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Amen. That's the end of our adversary. Our victory is sure in Christ Jesus the Lord. So let me ask you a question. Whose team are you on? Maybe you came here undecided. Now you know that if you're not on team Jesus, you are by default on the enemy's team. There are only teams, no matter what the world would tell you. There is the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God, and there's the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of our adversary, the devil. We must decide. And as you decide, you must decide stand firm. We must stand firm as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we don't stand firm, we're giving our adversary's team the advantage. If we're not doing what God has called us to do in this kingdom, in his kingdom, then we're giving the adversary the advantage. And we don't want to do that. We want to be about our father's business, doing what God has called us to do. As hard as it is, as we see in the scripture, God is faithful. And as we stand firm, and trust God in the midst of difficulties and make wise choices, God will meet us there, even as he met the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. With that, let's go ahead and stand up. We're gonna worship, but before we do, I'm gonna read the text for our communion passage today in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, I'm gonna read the text, and then as you stand um, we're going to be worshiping. And when you're ready, when you've prepared your heart, communion's about remembering what Jesus did on the cross, that he 
died for my sins and yours, that he gave his life so that I might have eternal life. He died so that my sins might be forgiven, so that your sins might be forgiven. And so we remember this on the first Sunday of every month. And so Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, Lord, thank you for your death. Thank you for your life, your death. Thank you for your resurrection. Thank you that we have the opportunity to remember and to celebrate and to worship you in this way. Lord, as we sing, as we wrap up this service, we pray that you would be glorified as we remember your sacrifice so that we might have life. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen.